Let praise be a weapon. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let's do it this morning. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing Jesus, yes. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Yeah. So let it Break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. Psalm that overcomes the raging sea. Yeah. Faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith. We trust you, Lord. We believe. Yes, we believe. Yes. The faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. The faith be the song that So let it rise, let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. Well, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side forever. Us this morning, we pray, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Yes, God, we praise you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Let heaven come to earth. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Yeah, yeah. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Yeah, this is what living looks like. What freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you Hey, yeah We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall We'll fear you cannot survive When we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise God. And we support him and his wife, John, Larry and Kay Mills. It's Wednesday, May the 25th. It's going to be here at church, and it's going to be a great opportunity. Also want to mention also, if you have any, um, let me pass a couple of things out here. We have that guest speaker, Marilyn Niebauer. Could I have a couple of ushers? We have a few things we want to pass out. This is for Marilyn. 
and then to give you that, and let me give you some of these too. These are for the gathering as well. We want to love on Elwood City. We just want to reach out to the town and let them know how much we love them. Appreciate Elwood City. Amen. It's a, we pray for our mayor. We pray for them, and that is a good thing. We want to thank all those who went and voted yesterday. We're believing for a good report. We're going to believe for a good change in government. And also, we have a memorial service for Narina Owens that's coming up on June the 18th. It's going to be at 11 a.m., and it's going to be an opportunity. Narina is a, was a blessing to our society, certainly in Elwood City. So if you're interested in seeing that, again, that's June 18th. We'll be announcing it. But I do want to mention how good it is to have everybody here tonight, and Pastor is going to pray. Thank you, Pastor Gail. Did you notice that? We got some great guest speakers. This Sunday is Marilyn Neubauer. Wednesday is Larry Mills from Turkey. And then the following Sunday is John Edwards from, Tur from uh, Ireland. So before, before I pray, let's just watch a video uh, of John Edwards just to get us kind of to know more about him. And if we could turn the lights down, that'd be great. And then this phone call rang in the hallway, and it was from me. My family had traced me through the benefit systems in the UK. And it was my sister. And she said, John, we love you, but I'm afraid we got some bad news for you. She said, Daddy has just died. Devastated me. I always wanted my, my father to see me clean and sober and making some. I was the first boy after four girls. I was his pride and joy. And I let him down. And then to make it worse, my family said, John, we love you, but please don't come home for the funeral. We're afraid if you come home, you get stoned and drunk and upset your mother and the rest of the family. The morning of my dad's funeral, something broke in me. And I had a choice. My self-talk was going crazy. I was thinking about sowing suicide into my life. And I was left with the choice. Will I live or will I die? Life was so tough, I needed to make a choice. And in my mind, I began to sow some positivity. Remember the vow that you made, that one day you'd be a voice for those people who can't speak for themselves. And that, together with some other thoughts, enabled me to make the, a decision to change my life. And I did. And in the third Wednesday of September, 1987, I had an encounter with the living God in a Christian meeting. I put myself into a different environment, an environment of hope, an environment where the power of God was working, an environment where the reality of Jesus Christ was working. And when I called out to God, something happened. And all of a sudden, it felt like the roof came off that building and the presence of God came into that room and it totally, completely transformed my life. Jesus Christ became my Lord and Savior. Changed my world. I've been clean and sober for 31 years now. Amen. When I got saved, I began to attend the church. All right. So I was actually wrong. It's not the following Sunday. It's two Sundays from this Sunday. From this Sunday. So I was almost right. But yeah, we're looking forward to him coming. And I encourage you to invite your friends, your neighbors. You don't know if they're going to say yes until you ask. Right? So just keep asking and find some new friends to ask. Will you be my friend? You want to go to church? <laughs> let's, let's stand together tonight. I'm going to pray. The Bible says, go out into all the world and preach and tell. So it's not good enough just to uh, be a good Christian, to do the right thing, you know, for yourself. You actually have to go and tell the good news and share the truth. Wouldn't you want someone to tell you if you were in their situation? Yeah, amen. So God, we thank you, Lord. Just like John Edwards said, Lord, we want the right environment for you to move in this place tonight. Lord, we just want to lift up your name, Lord. And as we surrender our will to your will, Lord, we want that experience with you. We want to touch the hem of your garment. We want to sit at your feet. We want to love on you. We're here as an act of our will, and we're here by choice. So, Lord, just respond in kind and visit with us. In Jesus' name, everyone said.
Precious blood, Lord, was shed for us. Your, your precious blood has paid for us all. You, you took our griefs and you carried.
do Cause I still believe Anything can happen When you move So won't you come here and move Please Let's sing that again No one wants to make things right No one wants to make things right More than you Have it your way Do what you long to do Cause I still believe Anything can happen when you move. So won't you come and move here? Yes, Lord. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God is never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I The name of all names And nothing can stand against And I choose to praise To glorify, glorify The name of all names And nothing can stand against Oh yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your To glorify. Let's go ahead and do it right now. Give the Lord a blessed clap offering to praise tonight. We bless your name, God. We glorify. I choose to praise.
great is you, God. Caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment. Never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, you don't owe me. Just want you. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. Open up my heart. Awaken us, awaken us, God. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. I've just got my agenda. I'm sorry. I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. And open up my heart to you.
I just want you, Lord. Those three things that John Edwards mentioned in that clip. He was in a dark place, and all he could think of was despair, suicide, darkness. But he said, I had to get into an environment where there was, remember what he said? The power of God and hope and the reality of Jesus. So that's what we want here. We want to show people the power of God, there's hope, and the reality of Jesus. That means they can have a place that they can get their minds renewed and begin to think differently, get a whole new mental attitude on life. Instead of thinking the worst is going to happen, begin to see get the possibilities with God. Instead of thinking, I have no hope, I'm, I'm just going to die in this. No. The power of God touching his life turned him around, transformed him. Made him a new creation in Christ, gave him a brand new start. So those three things, remember that if you're dealing with someone that's maybe in despair or in drugs, show them the hope of God, show them the power of God, and show them the reality of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that you are a reality to us today. Oh, we thank you that your presence is so important. We love your presence. We love being with you, Lord. Lord, that's where we get reinvigorated, recharged, revitalized, ready to go on and touch a life, Father, and transform a life. Thank you for doing it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Right now, let's just take a moment and say, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Thank you for a brand new start. Thank you for hope, for power, and the reality of Jesus. We are changed from glory to glory as by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer out there tonight, I want you to know you have a brand new start in life. He says, I'll take out that old stony heart, and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh. Take my spirit, put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. You know, a lot of people today are saying, you can go ahead and be seated. People are saying, well, what is the sign of Jesus coming? You know, that was a question that they asked Jesus in Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. What's the sign of your coming? And Jesus responded by saying that the the first thing he responded with was deception. You had to watch it. Don't get deceived. And, of course, the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that you can avoid deception by what? By having a love for the truth. When you have a love for the truth, you will not be deceived. Because the lie will come, but then you say, no, but this is what the truth says. A lie will come, and you say, no, but this is what the truth says. Amen. And so, then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they asked him, well, no, actually, they thought the rapture had already occurred. So the Apostle Paul has to write a second letter to the Thessalonians and tell them, look, it hasn't occurred yet. And the reason I can tell you it hasn't occurred, because one thing, one sign, one thing has to happen before that occurs. And he says there's going to be a falling away, an apostasia. And then, Jesus will come. Are we seeing that? Certainly are, aren't we? I don't have to elaborate on that one. You know that. I just heard the other day that in the evangelical churches, and we're an evangelical church, we're Pentecostal evangelical, but the evangelical churches, 9% of those people have a biblical worldview. But in the institutionalized church, the man-made religious order, and we say the denominational church, some of them, 1% have a biblical worldview, only 1%. And so it's a time 
for you and me to share. It's a time for parents to really do something about teaching their kids. You know, they say the best time to teach children the Word of God is from ages 6 to 12. That's the greatest time. Between 6 years old and 12 years old is the optimum time. And so, you know, in the 700 Club, they're giving a, a plug for the Superbook. Do you guys get the Superbook? You want to show that to your kids? Superbook? Yeah, you have an app. You have to get an app for that, I believe, don't you? It's free. That's right. Free Bible teachings to your children on Superbook. What an awesome opportunity. So I'm going to put a plug in for it right now, too. But what are we doing? We're contending for the faith. When you have things like this going on, listen to this. Forcing girls or young women to compete against biological males who claim to be women and then having them undress and change together in the locker rooms and use the same restroom facilities in our schools and university, universities, well, there's a backlash to that. Sixteen states have made laws that they are not going to allow these transgender people to participate in female sports. They're not going to ruin the female sports. Sixteen states have done that. How about this one? Activists purposely placing books and materials with graphic sexual pictures and erotic same-sex themes in the children's book sections in schools and public libraries, and then vociferously defending them as appropriate and necessary. Wrong. More and more people are getting involved in, in school boards and saying, no, get that off of those shelves. I'm, I'm a parent, and I don't want that taught to my kids. I don't want you telling my kids that stuff. Racial division being stoked under the guise of anti-racism through critical race theory. Seriously undermining progress made in civil rights and racial reconciliation and replacing it with suspicion and distrust. I just heard a, a black um, attorney, Leroy, or um, Terrell, Leo Terrell, say that this is an abomination, this critical race theory, because it is undermining the progress in civil rights in America. Then the other thing, children t being taken from their homes by government officials because their parents don't fully support their transitioning to the opposite sex. Come on, church, we got to speak up. It's time to begin to be vocal. In love, but stand up. No, we're not talking about violence now. We're just talking about speaking the truth and letting them know where we stand. We're not going to put up with this stuff. So let's teach our kids the, the Word of God. All right. In fact, let me pass this out to you right now. It's something on that will help just in your faith area. Esther, would you come on up? And where it says we need to release the Holy Spirit inside of us to those desperately who desperately need the miracle-working power of God. All right. I say a good article, I just run it off and give it to you. All right. Well, let's go ahead and give tonight. And let's give as unto the Lord. Oh, I wanted to say congratulations to Paul and Linda Mackenstein. Their daughter graduated from Westminster College and with great high honors and all sorts of achievements. And really, she graduated early too, didn't she, Paul? Earlier than normal because she was just so intelligent. So we, she, and uh, Nicole used to stand up here and play our play keyboard for us, and just a wonderful girl has a, has a wonderful heart, and good Christian girl. Let's give a great big God bless you, did Nicole and Paul and the family. Amen. Thank God for that. All right, are you ready to give tonight? Let's give as unto the Lord. All right. So we want to bring hope and power, and the reality of Jesus to people. Amen. We were in darkness. Yes. Okay, I guess we're, go we're ready to pray, huh? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord. We're going to tend our garden, Father God. That garden, Lord God, we're going to sow into our church the ministry, Father. We're going to sow, Lord God, in the kingdom of God. And, Father, we thank you for our tithes as holy. We bring it with an open hand and a glad heart. And, Father, we have our offering, seed for the sower and bread for the eater. And we give you all the honor and glory for you, our Lord God Almighty, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise God. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Feel free to stand with us. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name. And I just want to speak the name. Jesus, so every, every addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, oh, cause your name, cause your name is power, your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every, break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over I speak, I speak Jesus, oh, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, Jesus, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus, sing it out. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness of every enemy, Jesus for my family. Speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness of every enemy. Jesus for my family. Speak the holy name. Shadows burn like a fire. Cause your name, yeah, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Breaks through, break through, yes, break every stronghold, shine through the shadow. Last part, I just want, and I just want to speak the name of Jesus, Jesus, over every heart and every mind, because I know there is peace within your presence, 
Jesus tonight. Thank you, Father. We ask that you touch every person here tonight in a special way, Lord. You're equipping the saints, Father. You're making us change agents, Father. In the ministry of reconciliation, Father. Thank you, Lord. You gave commandment, be he reconciled to God. Be restored to favor with him. Thank you, Father. If you're out of sorts, if you're derailed, God wants you back on target. You know, Psalm 101 tells us, It says in Psalm 101, the middle of verse 3, it says, I hate the work of them that turn aside. Now, you know what that means? It means I hate the work of them that turn others aside. Oh, my goodness. Well, none of us are guilty of that, right? No. But we don't, in other words, we turn somebody aside from Jesus and they enter into that falling away that we talk, talked about. No, no. That's not a good situation there. Cause somebody to be re derailed or what have you. No. No, we want to do everything we can to build people up, edify them, encourage them. So I'm going to ask you one more time. You know, we've passed these out, but uh, this is a great opportunity. I, I want you to take two or three of these, and you probably can think of some neighbors and people. Ushers, would you help me one more time? I know we already passed these out, but take two or three of these if you would. And uh, pass them out. Don't wallpaper your walls with them, but, you know, <laughs> pass them out to somebody that needs a touch from Jesus. If they need a healing, come Sunday night, right? Hallelujah. Well, last Wednesday, we talked about rising up and standing and fighting the good fight of faith. And we said that sometimes we're a little too docile. Sometimes we need to just fight the good fight of faith. And that's the best fight. You know, when you're fighting to stay in faith, God's going to do the fighting for you, isn't he? He's going to go to battle for us. The battle is not ours, but it's the Lord's. Have you found Joshua chapter 3 yet? Maybe I didn't tell you to go there yet. <laughs> Joshua chapter 3, please. <laughs> if you haven't found it, just, just look off with your neighbor, <laughs> your neighbor's phone or whatever. I'm actually, I'm going to start on a little bit into chapter 4. Father, thank you for your word tonight. We bless you in Jesus' name. This is chapter, excuse me, chapter 2 in verse... 23, Joshua chapter 2, verse 23. Then the two spies came down from the hill country, crossed the Jordan River, and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. The Lord will certainly give us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. God had promised them this land. Just like we read last Wednesday over there in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, he says, I've already given you this land, but you're going to have to go in and take it. You're going to have to go possess your possession. In other words, you're going to have to fight to obtain it, even though God had given it. Well, we have a similar situation here with the children of Israel. They just heard from the two spies, and they said, look, we can go in and take this land because they're terrified of us. And so verse Chapter 3, verse 1 says, the Israelites crossed the Jordan. Well, that's the heading. It says, early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Achaia and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite leaders went through the camp, giving them instructions, these instructions to the people. <laughs> so prior to going in and crossing the Jordan River and going into the, the Jordan, land of Jordan, well, Canaan land, really, where God told them, you have to go in and fight now to possess your possession. They rested. They had three days there where they rested. You know, it's probably a good idea when you're entering into some sort of a difficulty or conflict or a battle or something to, to pull back and have some time of rest and refreshing where you can get with God and just get quiet. Sometimes I have to do that, just get off by a river or someplace and, and just begin to meditate and think and pray and get quiet. And I found that God will speak to you when you do that. Remember, he says, be still and know that I am God. Well, they were getting refreshed and getting ready for a big battle here. And they told him in uh, beginning in verse 4, since you have never traveled this way before, 
they will guide you. The, the priest will do this. The Levitical priest, it says in the previous verse, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, he says, follow them. Now, what's the Ark of the Covenant represent? Somebody know? The presence of God. And so he says, you're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, the priests are going to carry it, and they're going to, I want you all to have your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant. He wants our eyes on the presence of God. And so that's what they did. And they went through the, town, through the group of people, two and a half million people, and gave them instructions ahead of time. He says, stay about a half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Get yourself set apart. God wants to do something through you. You know that God knows who his people are, doesn't he? And he's about to pour his power through you to a lost and dying generation. So in the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant, lead the people across the river, and so they started out. And he says, the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin, this is verse 7, to make you great in the eyes of all the Israelites. Now they will know that I am with you. Now they will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give these instructions to the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop. In other words, act in faith. How many know faith is an act? Something happens when you take that first step. He's telling them, just put your feet in the water. Faith without corresponding action is dead being alone, it says in the book of James. I remember when we first looked at this property. My wife and I and even some other leadership people came out here and there was snow on the ground, wasn't there? And we walked the perimeter of this property. And doesn't the Bible say every place that the soles of your feet touch shall be yours? So that's what we were thinking. And so that's what we did. Nearly 10 acres in the winter, plumping through snow probably about that deep and marking it off. But we were taking a step of faith. He said, that sounds a little foolish. No, I'm not God's eyes, it's not. No. Because spiritual things will turn into reality and turn into natural things, won't they? And so it was an act of faith that he said, put your feet in the water. So Joshua told the Israelites, let's go. Said in verse 10, today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Termites. <laughs> huh? Think of it. The Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the earth, will lead you across the river. And so they even made a memorial. But anyhow, let's go over, let's go over to verse 15. Now, it was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, I have not, but people have told me that the Jordan River isn't very wide. But back then, see, in the harvest season, the Jordan River had so much water that it would overflow its banks in the harvest season. And this is the time of the year that they're crossing. You know, I've studied since my great-grandfather was in the Civil War about the Battle of Fredericksburg and the Rappahannock River had to be crossed by the Union soldiers to go over into Fredericksburg to at least attempt to defeat the Confederates under Robert E. Lee. And uh, my wife and I visited Fredericksburg, and we saw the Rappahannock River, and it's not very wide at all now. But at that time, it was very wide. They had to build pontoon bridges across it. So things do change over the, over the time, but that river's still there, the Rappahannock. The Jordan River is still there, but at this time, it was overflowing its banks, so it was somewhat treacherous. But it says here in verse 
16, but as soon as their feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water began piling up at a town upward called Adam, which is near Zaratan, and the water below that point flowed into the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the city of Jericho. So, as soon as they put their feet in the water, the Bible says the waters were cut off. They, were, they congealed. They say, it sounds to me like the crossing of the Red Sea. No, it's a little different. Picture this, if you will. When Moses put his rod up there, and the, it says the Red Sea parted, just went like that, and the waters went like this, and then it made this huge pathway for the children of Israel to walk across on dry ground. This is a little bit different. This is a flowing Jordan River, and the minute they put their feet in the water, the waters were cut off right there. They were congealed and made a wall of water. The rest of the water just continued to flow down the Jordan River into the Dead Sea. So it was a little bit different, but the waters also dried up. Now you think about a muddy riverbed. God had to have caused the, even the droplets of water in the mud to come out of there and dry up enough so that the people could walk across on dry ground. What a m- wonderful miracle. He is a God of detail. That's right. And so the, he they had the people make a couple of memorials there to remind the people because they wanted their children to know in the future what happened, this wonderful miracle that took place here. And I forgot to tell you, the Ark of the Covenant is standing right there in the middle. They're holding it up like this while the people come across, two and a half million people. It's almost like Moses' rod, (laughs) the presence of God is holding up that wall. So So it's amazing. They took 12 stones and they put the stones right there in that riverbed. Evidently, they protruded out of the water somehow. I don't know, big, huge stones, 12 of them. But not only that, when they got to the other side, they made another memorial out out of the water with 12 stones. They wanted to be sure that when the children, their children grew up and they came to this spot, they would be able to say, hey, God did a wonderful miracle right here, kids. And this is, these stones are a memorial to that. But it's interesting to note what happened. Let's look here. It says, meanwhile, this is verse 17, meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until everyone had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Then it goes on into chapter 4 to tell about those monuments. And I want you to see something in verse 13. Now go on to chapter 4, verse 13. It says, these warriors, about 40,000 strong, were ready for battle, for they crossed over to to the plains of Jericho in the Lord's presence. Everybody say the plains of Jericho. That day the Lord made Joshua great in the eyes of all Israelites and the rest of his life. They revered him as much as they had revered Moses. The Lord had said to Joshua, command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. And so Joshua gave the command, as soon as the priest carrying the Ark of the Lord His covenant came out of the riverbed. The Jordan River flooded its banks as before and began to flow normally. I showed you a scripture there in chapter 4, verse 13. It says that when they came out of this river, they were at the plains of Jericho. There was a monument there at Gilgal, that 12-stone monument, But here's something I want you to see. When they crossed the Jordan, they were in sight of their next challenge, which was Jericho. (laughs) Joshua chapter 6. You know, you finish one battle, one miracle, and God says, don't sit down on on your hands too long because I got another challenge for you. You got to be ready, right? We're contending for the faith, right? (laughs) 
The enemy's persistent, so you just got to be ready, right? So think about it. They just, Joshua chapter 3 finished one miracle, and here's another one facing them. I mean, they can see it. They come out of the waters to Gilgal where they built this monument, and they can see the plains of Jericho. They can see the walls of Jericho. You know what happened to Jericho. You read chapter 6 of Joshua, and God told the children of Israel, I want you to surround Jericho. Remember? That's their next battle. I want you to surround it, and I want you to march around it. I don't want anybody to say a word. Keep your mouth shut. (laughs) And I want you to march around this city seven times, one time each day for seven days. And the seventh day, the walls are coming down. Now, you can imagine, that's probably why I had them keep their mouth shut, because their mind's saying, just march around here, and it's going to knock these walls down. So, they're quiet the first time around. When they come to make the turn, they can look back and say, hey, Here's where we crossed the Jordan. In their minds now, not out loud. That's where we crossed the Jordan. God did a miracle then. He'll do another one now for us. David had to do the same thing when he defeated Goliath, didn't he? When he said, you uncircumcised Philistine, he wasn't trying to give him an anatomy lesson. David was saying, this guy has no covenant. He says, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. And I'll take the head off of this giant because he doesn't have a covenant, right? By the way, that stone really wasn't what killed Goliath, was it, when he threw that stone? But that stone put him in position to be killed, didn't it? (laughs) And he took his own sword and cut cut his head off, right? So here the people are marching around Jericho. So they come the second time around, come up. They might be getting discouraged. They're not saying anything. And they look, they come to make this turn. Oh, there's the Jordan. We just crossed that. You see, you could see Jericho from the Jordan, and you could, I mean, where they came out, and they could see the Jordan as well, the same place at Gilgal where they, where they were victorious. They could see it. And what did it do? It encouraged them. That's why, like David did, he says, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. He was going back into the past and re- remembering what God had done before. And see, this was the same thing. You're looking over here and saying, look, this is what God did for us before. Guess what? I'm going back there and march again because these walls are about to come down. He did one miracle, he'll do another one. (laughs) Glory to God. So anyhow, you know the story. They marched six times in six days, and on the seventh day, the walls came tumbling down. You read it in Joshua chapter 6, and you can find out the archaeologist's report. When they went to that site at Jericho, they found out that those walls didn't just fall over like this. They fell inward into the ground. Check it out. I remember when I was going to Geneva College, I, I read that at the library in something, in an archaeology book or something, and I thought, wow, a supernatural God. He just t- caused the walls, and these were huge walls. I mean, I think somebody said they even had livestock on the top of these walls. There was so much room. But these huge walls went shh right down into the ground, and the children of Israel walked right in and were able to defeat the enemy because God had given the land to them, but they had to go in and fight every step of the way, right? Hallelujah to Jesus. Woo! So, take a tip from the, your chil- the children of Israel. Rehearse your past victories. When you get up against something, Look back and say, yeah, I remember back here when God delivered me from cancer. Or I remember back here when I was flying that airplane and we took off 
on August 4th, 2014, my wife and I to go to Coshocton, Ohio, Downing Field. And we headed on an eastward takeoff. And we got about 150 feet in the air, and the airplane starts to shake like this. You know, like a car misses. Well, we told the tower, and the tower says, well, you go ahead and land on any runway that you want to. We'll keep the rest of the airplanes away. So we nursed that engine, and I lost 40 to 50% of the power on that engine on a climb out, crucial time. Anyhow, we managed to inch it up to 400 feet. Pattern altitude is 1,000 feet. We couldn't get there. We all could get this 400 feet. She's praying. I'm working with that engine, and she was praying. <laughs> but we were rehearsing our past victories. He did it before. He'd do it again. So we come on around, did sort of a kamikaze approach to runway 10, landed, and the moment we pulled off of that runway under the taxiway, I mean the moment we did that, the engine quit dead. There was an airline pilot that flew out of that airport, and he came up, and another guy. And they, you know, I told the tire, my engine just quit. So we had to, all of us, get together and get a tow bar, and we towed the plane back. And, but that was Jesus that kept that engine running. And when I tell that story, when I tell you that account, my wife can verify it. Is, was that true, honey? I had perfect peace. You had perfect peace. I did. I had perfect peace. All right. I never said Whoops. <laughs> they want to hear from you. I know he'll know what to do. And he did. But I mean, you yeah. we were trained. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever wisdom I had, he gave it to me. Yes. yes. But I had peace in him and you. Yeah. That you would know what to do. And so they t tried to turn that prop through by hand, and it just went like a feather. There was no compression in the engine. The uh, exhaust valve had stuck, so when they took the, the, the cylinder apart, it was all black on the inside. So anyhow. The, yeah, that's right. But every, year, every, every time we took off, we'd always pray. But anyhow. So rehearse your past victories. Rehearse and witness to people. Tell them about what Jesus has done for you. And when you do, it's kind of like looking back at, yep, I remember what he did at Jericho. <laughs> Guess what he's going to do? I mean, at uh, Jordan, excuse me. I know what he's going to do at Jericho now. Let's stand tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, when you get into a fight, remember this. It's not the size of the, the dog in the fight that counts. <laughs> because you and God are a majority, right? Amen. And uh, David just did a bunch of trash talking to, to Goliath, didn't he? Probably told him, listen, I'm going to make a giant jerky out of you, you know. <laughs> So, everything that stands in your way, begin to talk to it. Begin to speak to it. And begin to glorify God in all that you say and do. His presence is what we need. It's His presence that parted those waters, and it's His presence that will make a way for you where there doesn't seem to be a way. So, we always have to have time for the presence of God, right? Let's just take a moment right now, lift our hands to heaven and say, thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, from which we get direction, from which we get miracle power. Oh, yes, Lord, from which we get our hope and the reality of Jesus. Thank you for it, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, let's shout unto God with the voice of trying. Let me hear you shout. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening. And don't forget, Sunday, bring somebody out now, Marilyn Neubauer. And then, missionary from Turkey, next Wednesday, Larry Mills, Larry and Kay Mills, you'll be blessed. They've been over there for years. You'll be truly blessed to hear them. Amen. Amen.